Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another podcast breakdown. We're going to be checking out generative energy number five between Danny Roddy and Georgie Dinkov. So today we're going to be breaking down a few different topics. I think this is going to be a long one, so I'm going to break it up into three different sections. So this will be a part one, and uh, it, it is a three-hour podcast, obviously, so it's pretty long. In this uh, specific part, we're going to be talking about a few different things. So we got the battle between glucose and fat oxidation during stress, how serotonin, prolactin, and cortisol tie into metabolic dysfunction, and the misunderstood role of testosterone and androgens in hormonal health, and lastly, how PUFAs and estrogen are silently contributing to aging and disease. So this is going to be maybe a long one, so let's just get right into it. Okay, so let's kick things off with one of the most foundational ideas in Ray Pete's work. How our bodies decide whether to burn glucose or fat, especially when you're under stress. So most mainstream advice tells us, burn more fat for fuel, it's cleaner. But as Georgie and Danny explain, that couldn't be further from the truth when it comes to maintaining long-term health. Here is the big idea. Under ideal non-stress conditions, your body wants to burn glucose. It's faster, more efficient, and few, produces fewer damaging byproducts. But when you're under stress, whether it's from fasting, cold, intense exercise, or even emotional strain, your body shifts towards fat oxidation. And that's when the problems start. Whenever fat is oxidized, preferentially over glucose, that's a marker of stress, not optimal function. Now, why is this a problem though? So when your body relies on fat oxidation too heavily, especially PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats, it increases lipolysis, which is the breakdown of stored fat. That might sound like a good thing, you know, because everybody wants to burn fat or lose fat, but what actually gets released are free fatty acids, which are unstable and can damage cells, reduce mitochondrial function, and even break, uh, block glucose from being used properly. So kind of think of it like this. Think of it like a fuel switch. So glucose is the premium gas your car runs on best. Fat is the emergency backup. You don't want to run on that long term. So they also highlight a study where animals under stress shifted toward fat oxidation. And with that, within hours, their blood sugar dropped and their stress hormones like cortisol skyrocketed. That's the body's desperate attempt to keep things going, not a sign of good health. So what should we take away from this? Glucose is your primary preferred fuel, especially for the brain, heart, and thyroid. This is why they always recommend more carbs and um, not and to keep like fats low. That's where that Randall cycle comes in. So burning fat under stress is a survival mechanism, not a performance upgrade. The more your body prefers fat oxidation over glucose, the more you're likely dealing with chronic stress or even thyroid suppression. So just to recap, you want to burn primarily carbs. This uh, basically lowers cortisol in your body. You don't want to be uh, putting free fatty acids in the blood, which will then compete with the glucose, which could possibly, you know, run into like insulin issues and diabetes and whatnot. But to keep the carbs high and the fat intake low, and to keep lipolysis low. Some things that they recommend also is like aspirin that lowers free fatty acid or uh, excessive lipolysis or niacinamide, you know, vitamin B3. Uh, but those are just a few things. Now, there's a lot more to cover, so let's get into the next topic. All right, so we're moving into the next section. And before we go there, I just wanna go back to the last section where we were talking about the carbs and all that stuff. So before this, I actually had one of those McDonald's milkshakes. Actually, it's not even a milkshake, it's a smoothie mango and pineapple smoothie which was like really good and it has 78 grams of carbs back in the day i would have thought that was crazy especially when i was doing keto so now i'm the complete opposite uh low fat high carb especially funny now that like that honey diet and sugar diet is uh blowing up right now so it's hilarious like there's always these waves of keto and then uh ray p or sugar diet and carnivore and all that stuff but it's it's just hilarious that now a high sugar diet is coming to the mainstream so let's get to the next section we're going to be talking about serotonin prolactin and the stress cascade so in this next section you know we're going over the podcast generative energy number five georgie and danny were digging into something 
that most people have completely backwards, the idea that serotonin is the feel-good chemical. So serotonin is a stress hormone. It's not something the body elevates when it's in a good place. It's elevated in response to injury, hypoglycemia, stress, and inflammation. That's a pretty big shift from what you've been told. And you hear the word serotonin and think, oh, antidepressants, happiness, or mood boosters. But according to Ray Pete and Georgie, that's a pharmaceutical myth, is it? <laughs> Under stress like poor sleep or low blood sugar, inflammation, your body increases serotonin. And what does serotonin do? It stimulates the release of prolactin, another hormone that gets a bad rap in Pete's work. So prolactin is usually associated with things like breastfeeding or nurturing, but chronically elevated prolactin in both men and women, uh, you can cause decreased libido, suppressed thyroid function, increased fat storage, and even feelings of apathy or depression. So high prolactin is almost always present in the hypothyroid state. If you're not producing energy properly, serotonin and prolactin go up and they keep you in a suppressed state. So Danny makes a great observation as well. So he says that prolactin creates this almost fog-like depression. And in Ray's view, it's more of a shutdown chemical than something involved in emotional warmth. So the big takeaway here is that serotonin isn't always your friend. In fact, chronically elevated serotonin and prolactin might be why you're stuck in a low energy state in a high stress loop. So what breaks the loop? According to Georgie and Danny, the thyroid hormone T3, the active hormone, lowers both serotonin and prolactin. Sugar and salt help lower serotonin by stabilizing blood sugar and reducing stress hormones. Just make sure you get enough potassium as well. And uh, dopamine supporting strategies like bright light, protein, and movement help shift the balance away from prolactin and into a more energetic, motivated state. So it's just an interesting kind of uh, idea to think about. It's kind of like, is you're not depressed because you're low on serotonin, but you're depressed because you're not making energy properly. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, so that covers that topic. Now let's move on to the next one. All right, hopefully you guys aren't too bored of my voice yet, but we're gonna be getting to section three now. We're gonna be discussing estrogen. So when most people hear the word estrogen, they think women. But Georgie and Danny make it crystal clear in the episode that estrogen is a systemic stress hormone and it's not just a female issue. Men also have estrogen. Testosterone aromatizes into estrogen. Technically, you could have a sky-high testosterone level, but you could also have a sky-high estrogen level depending on what kind of stress your body's going through. So estrogen is not just a reproductive hormone. It's produced all over the body, including in the fat tissue, brain, and even blood vessels, and it acts as a stress signal. In the Ray Pete framework, estrogen is elevated during stress, injury, hypoxia, or even energy failure. It can suppress thyroid function, cause water retention, increase serotonin and prolactin, and promote fat storage. Basically, it locks your body into a stress state. So when you start viewing estrogen as a stress hormone, rather than this beautiful female hormone, it changes your whole perspective. I mean, supposedly, Estrogen's not even really a female hormone. Really, it's just, it's actually progesterone. Uh, so there's like everything is backwards. So what's the real danger here? The podcast highlights that estrogen doesn't need to be sky high to be a problem. It's all about the ratios. So particular, particularly between progesterone and estrogen, or in men, androgens and estrogen. If estrogen becomes dominant, even at normal levels, it can cause serious metabolic issues. So estrogen elevates uh, nitric oxide, serotonin, and cortisol while suppressing the thyroid and dopamine. It's a shutdown hormone. <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. Estrogen also increases clotting risks, uh, slows liver detoxification, and promotes fibrosis, which is a fancy way of saying it leads to tissue scarring and aging. So in men, specifically, excess estrogen can show up as low libido, Fat gain, especially around the hips and chest, gynecomastia, is that how you say it? Gyno. Uh, low energy and mood and suppressed testosterone. And in women, it's linked to PMS, heavy periods, fibroids, endometriosis, 
MPCOS, depression, anxiety, and fluid retention. Uh, so most people walking around today, men and women are in a state of estrogen dominance, most likely because environmental things such as environmental estrogen. So like plastics, soys, pesticides, poor li liver function, stress, and lack of protective hormones like progesterone, DHEA, and testosterone. So what can we actually do about this? Support your liver's detoxification with nutrients like vitamin E, taurine, and aspirin. I've actually been doing a lot of taurine recently um, in the morning and at night. I think 500 milligrams. Um, I guess it's kind of helping the stress load and cortisol, if that's actually there. Um, do feel less stressed, I guess you could say, and sleep better. Um, I do do also occasionally vitamin E um, and aspirin as well. So these all help the liver detoxify lower free fatty acids in the blood, blood excessive lipolysis, help use glucose better, um, and anti-estrogen, anti-aromatase, uh, oh, not anti, but it acts as a mild aromatase inhibitor, the vitamin E specifically and aspirin. Uh, what else? That's it. Let's just continue on here. That was just kind of like what I was thinking about. So use the raw carrot salads, which I, I need to get back into. I was doing that for a little while, then kind of stopped. That's like a natural estrogen binder. So that'll scrub your whole gut and uh, not allow your body to reabsorb the estrogen. So you're just going to excrete it all out, which is a good thing. Improve thyroid function. So the body can actually deactivate uh, estrogen properly. Uh, always check your temperature in the morning to see if your thyroid functions right. You know, you want to be like 97 point something before you have breakfast and then after breakfast, go to like 98.6 Fahrenheit, uh, check your pulse and all that. Um, and if needed, consider progesterone and DHEA, but always cautiously and in context. Now, no, that's these are two uh, other things that I kind of started also. DHEA, five milligrams in the morning uh, with you want to eat that with like a fat as well. You don't want to just take that with, uh, you know, carbs alone because it's a fat soluble uh, steroid, I guess you could say, hormone. And progesterone at night, just very minimal, like for men specifically, you don't wanna go overboard with it. You'd be good with just like two drops, which would be like six milligrams. This is not uh, health advice or anything, obviously do your own research, but I do feel like a, a relaxation effect and kind of sleep better, uh, a lot better with the progesterone. And that's not something you have to do constantly. You could just, uh, cycle it in a way because it is a fat soluble uh, hormone so it does get stored uh, same with vitamin E so uh, the problem isn't just estrogen being high it's estrogen being unopposed and that the imbalance is what drives the chronic health issues that we see everywhere today so we got one more section to go over and we'll get started now all right we got section four the last section so this is the fat trap hufa weight gain and metabolic block and just to go back to the last section when I was talking about the DHEA and the uh, progesterone, with the DHEA specifically, like it depends on your age and all that. Obviously, you want to just get tested to see what your levels actually are. That's something I need to do soon. Um, but that's um, DHEA is like uh, the top level kind of deal. So that could actually get converted into testosterone or estrogen. So that's where if it possibly converts over to estrogen, that's where the progesterone kind of comes in. It's uh, like an anti-estrogen in a way, or a, and it blocks cortisol as well. And it's like a, also no aromatase inhibitor. So that's kind of why you want to almost use the DHEA and progesterone together just in case. But again, don't go crazy with the progesterone. And again, this is not health advice or anything like that. So uh, do your own research. So in this final section of the podcast, we dive into one of Ray Pete's most emphasized enemies, PUFAs, or obviously polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so the body cannot oxidize PUFA properly. So when you're burning fat, especially under stress or fasting, you're flooding your system with toxic byproducts. So to break that down, PUFA, which is includes omega-6, like you find in seed oils or even chicken or pork, like a lot of people kind of get stuck on the idea like, oh, it's just seed oil. Stay away from that. Like non grass fed beef also has what's called not seed oils, but omega six fats. So when they're grass fed, their gut uh, produce the fat more efficiently and it's more saturated. So, again, pork, chicken, they're going to be higher in PUFA omega six. 
Uh, so which in, so PUFA, which includes omega-6 like in seed oils and omega-3s like in fish oil, is highly unstable. So when the body burns it for energy, it produces harmful compounds like lipid peroxides, aldehydes, and prost prostaglandins, and that they damage the cells, tissues, and even DNA. So PUFAs suppress the met metabolism at every level. They block thyroid hormone, damage mitochondria, and promote inflammation. So ironically, when someone tries to lose fat by eating less or fasting, especially if they've stored a lot of PUFA over the years, they actually can get sicker. So it's like your body poison, uh, burning poison instead of fuel. That's kind of crazy to think about it that way. Um, that's kind of funny, like th there's like that keto flu. So once you start doing keto, you know, you, you lose all that excess water, which is glycogen, uh, but also any other water maybe stored in the body. Then you start going through the fat stores and that's probably what that keto flu is. Maybe it's like you burning off like that garbage that's just stored in there. Never really thought of it that way before. So, and because of their structure, they stay in the body for years. It can take up to three to four years or more of consistent low PUFA intake to significantly lower tissue stores. So you want to avoid PUFA sources like seed oils, canola, soy, sunflower, fatty fish oils, commercial nuts and seeds. You want to favor more saturated fats like coconut oil, butter, dairy fat, and cocoa butter. Supporting the metabolism with thyroid, carbs, vitamin E, and red light therapy to help the body oxidize fat safely. Uh, it's not just about calories. It's the type of fat you eat and burn matters massively. So, and... And that's like the trap that most people don't see. They focus on cutting fat, but not the right kind. So PUFA makes the body slower, sicker, and more inflamed, and it can sabotage even the best health efforts unless it's addressed directly. All right, so that brings this podcast breakdown of generative energy number five to a close. Remember, this is part one. We're going to also do probably a part two and three, uh, depending on how much information is left in those podcasts. And again, this is just a, a breakdown and served to meant to be like a companion piece to the original work between uh, Danny Roddy and Georgie Dinkov on their podcast. Uh, so let me know what you think of this breakdown. I do have a few more that I've done in the past if you want to check those out. If you're interested and want to uh, subscribe, go for it. Uh, leave a like and a comment. Give me some feedback on what you think of these. And uh, if there's anything else I should um, work on or do better, uh, but I think that pretty much covers it. Thanks for stopping by and I'll see you in the next one.